shit. Hi, I'm Alan um, Moss. I work for um, the union, Rutgers AUPAFT, and I've been working with the University Budget and Priorities Committee, who you're going to hear members of today talking about follow the money, talking about how the Rutgers budget shapes the university. Um, and we have, I'm not going to spend much time because I want to get to those folks. Um, we have Michelle Gittleman speaking. We have Andrew Goldstone um, next. Um, I believe Juan Gonzalez will speak after that if Juan, is uh, Juan, if Juan comes and um, when Juan, Juan gets here and then Mark Killingsworth will, will bring us home. So um, what we're going to do is, is divide this out into about 15 minute sections um, and speakers are going to present for five, seven, nine minutes. And then we'll have some time for individual Q and A's. And then when we get through all four speakers, we'll come back at the end for a general Q and A. So I'm going to start by spotlighting Michelle Gittleman, um, oh. faculty in um, the business school in Newark. Um, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see my slides. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Michelle Gittleman. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming. We've been meeting regularly and we've been uh, going over Rutgers finances um, to try to, it's a very complex, it's a $4 billion budget um, to try to understand what's happening, where the money comes from and, and where it goes. So I'd like to present with you just a big overview. I hope you all saw Howard Buntis's amazing presentation. It's been recorded. It gives the overview of Rutgers financial health right now. I highly encourage you to see it if you haven't seen it. This is kind of a follow on. And Alan, I think I'm going to go over five minutes, but uh, I, I might take about 10 or 12 or so. Um, and please use chat if you have questions or comments. I'm not going to follow that while I'm talking, but if other folks here um, on the committee or otherwise can respond, that's great. And if not, I'll see the chat uh, afterwards and, and try to address it. We're hopefully going to have time at the very end for an open Q&A following any brief questions for each person. So I just want to um, start by framing the, the financial situation, which if you did see Howard's presentation, you know is pretty good right now. We have some of the best financial performance in years. Revenues are actually up from pre-COVID levels. Appropriations are up. We've had a lot of COVID funding come in. And enrollments, despite some really dire predictions, haven't fallen by that much. A pretty healthy enrollment situation. We are flush. Uh, in terms of reserves have a record level, reached a record level, and we have a strong Moody's uh, financial health grade. So I've put up some of our demands, um, which really are about, we generate the money, we want our fair share, certainly keeping pace with inflation, um, addressing a lot of the inequities. And these demands, I think, don't represent a major financial ask given the financial situation we're in, which is pretty good. On the other hand, we hear back, well, we don't have the money. Um, we're going into a deficit. We have to tighten our belts. And we are. Uh, so there's this kind of puzzle going on. What's going on? Are they lying to us? Are we in deficit? So that's kind of how I want to start out and to explain how both of these things can actually be true at the same time. So it helps to really look at how our budget system operates. And this is just the consolidated budget for Rutgers um, showing you. And we have a system called responsibility centered management in which the um, academic units have individual responsibility for their own profit and loss performance. Um, but in practice, the way RCM works is really to centralize a lot of the allocation and research decisions in central administration. So what we, um, each of the academics units pay into what are called cost pools. And these are charges by central on each of the departments and units um, that are taken to cover things that we share, like libraries, like information technology. Those are centralized costs and they're allocated across the units. 
um, but they're paid for by central, like our use of facilities. But they also cover the cost of administration and they cover the cost of things like strategic programs, loans to the athletics department, debt, and of course they fund savings. Um, so these cost pools turn out to be super important in our daily lives. Um, they're set using an algorithm uh, that charges us based on usage and other and enrollment and headcount, but we don't know what that algorithm is. So the charges sort of come, and we also don't know how the money gets allocated. There are 11 cost pools. We don't know what goes into each, and again, how the money comes back to the departments. So I'm going to share with you just some overview of some numbers coming out of the financial report. And these are actual budgets. I'll share the link with you to this report if you wanna look at it, it's the budget. Um, this is showing us revenues and expenses by campus. And I'm calculating this on a per student basis so that we can compare campuses that are very different in terms of size, but per student, they don't look hugely different in terms of the revenue that each one is generating. And even the composition of the revenue and the expenses, most of the revenue comes from tuition, um, grants are important, appropriations, uh, compensation is obviously a big piece. And I just wanna highlight just here that there's not a huge amount of structural differences um, and they're all in surplus. And this is a local budgets. And I wanna highlight this for you here. This is the budget surplus of each campus per student again. The, um, the blue is New Brunswick, the orange is Newark, and the gray is Camden. And if you look on the left, before these central charges are taken per student, each campus shows a local operating surplus of between about five and $10,000 per student. In the middle, you see the cost pool charges and they pretty much equate to that exact surplus. So what happens is at the end, when we're done paying central, we're left with nothing except for Camden, which is in deficit. So um, that's how it works. And we don't end up with any surplus in our budgets. It all goes into central. Um, I didn't put healthcare up here, RBHS, because it's actually a lot bigger, but it shows a very similar pattern and I can show it to you later if you're interested. This is just drilling down into each of the various schools and I see a lot of you from different places. So this is showing, um, uh, this is now aggregate, no longer by student. So you see all the big size differences, but we have New Brunswick, um, school of Arts and Sciences as the biggest than my own school, the, the business school, the School of Engineering, Newark. The, red, the blue is revenues, the orange is expenses, and that's all in expenses for that unit locally. And then that red is the cost pool on top of the orange, okay? So it's a huge chunk for each of these schools. And I want to just, if you glance at it across, you'll see that the blue is bigger than the orange in each case. Uh, so there are surpluses in each of these schools, um, except for athletics, which is in deficit. The orange is higher than the blue, um, and it has almost zero cost pool charges. So that's the one that's perpetually in deficit, although I wouldn't call it an academic unit. Mark will talk about that later. This is now showing the same sort of data, except that I'm showing you the operating margin of the different schools. So here, what we have is the budget surplus as a percent of revenue, um, sort of the profit rate, uh, if you will, to the extent this accounting data represents true, true surpluses. You know, School of Nursing, 40% uh, of, of revenue is, is in surplus. That's before the cost pool is taken are these green lines, and they're pretty high. But after the cost pool is the red. And then you see here that for most of the schools, again, no surplus left, but it's in negative uh, for most of them, um, except for two. One is the business school and the other is the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. But everyone else ends up either zero or in deficit after the central charges are taken. In particular, on the very right hand, 
um, New Brunswick School of Arts and Sciences, the Mason Gross School, and the Newark uh, Law School. Um, there's a tax that actually puts them well into deficit. I'm just reporting what are from these financial statements. I don't actually have the true stories behind what's going into these numbers, but I think um, it's very interesting to look at the snapshot of what's going on with central charges. I want to show you where the surplus is coming from and where it goes. So this is just the budget, local budget surpluses of all four units here, campuses, New Brunswick, and I'm adding the health service. And this, again, this is surplus, what's left over when you take revenue minus cost. Um, so New Brunswick and RBHS are generating a lot of the surplus. Where does it go? After the central cost pool is taken, uh, only 14% is left for all of the units to share. So all of that surplus is going into central. And I think this is how I reconcile this idea that we have a lot of money, but we're in a budget squeeze. It's because by the time the charges are taken, there's very little for the rest of us to allocate amongst all of us. And within that green slice, how is that allocated? That's administrative salaries is that piece, which is pretty stunning uh, of how high that is. Um, 350 million, I don't have the number in my head, um, but that's all coming, you know, of course, out of the academic units to pay for administrative compensation. So, um, you know, I think my takeaway from these numbers is, Where's my money? <laughs> is this really austerity? Are we really in a budget squeeze or is this a kind of planned uh, manufactured scarcity? Um, on the one hand, we have academic units that are incentivized to constantly increase profit-making opportunities and cut programs that don't generate revenue like doctoral education, for instance, um, or small classes and so on. Um, but the more surplus we generate, the more these cost pools sweep them away to central and there's really no accountability of how that money gets spent or how it gets returned to the units. I don't know many, how many here are department chairs, but the ones I've spoken to are pretty uh, confused about the complexity of that process. So these cost pools appear, the central charges do appear to perpetuate austerity at the local level. Um, we don't have the departmental support we need. Administrative budgets locally are cut, but the budgets at the top are growing. And I think importantly too, it centralizes decision-making over resources because so much of the money that is earned in the academic units flows to central who gets to decide how it then gets allocated on important things like how much gets spent on um, instruction you know, versus things like debt, even what's an appropriate reserve level, athletics and so on. Do I have two minutes left, Alan, or should I close out here? Um, sure, um, there's no Q and there's no questions in the chat Okay, yet. so I'll just take the next, I just wanna highlight their strategy in a way, and this is coming right out of Howard's report. Um, this is how Moody's ranks our, any university's financial criteria, uh, health. And there's a whole bunch of financial criteria and then the weights um, in the third or fourth column and how Rutgers stacks up. But I wanna just highlight the last three, brand and strategic positioning, the operating environment, these are kind of fuzzy categories and financial policy and strategy. And if you read how those criteria are weighted in Moody's, these are not <laughs> measurable. It really comes down to, do you have a strong central administration with a lot of control over resource allocation? And that means not such a strong faculty pushing back on some of these decisions. So that's kind of what's motivating their strategies to push on these levers. I think on our side, you know, we're, um, we do have a strong faculty union. We're pushing back on some of these priorities for this particular campaign. I think we can answer, you know, Rutgers does seem to have the money, but longer term to work towards a more fair and transparent budget system. So here are some of the points that I think will be the principles be 
of a better budget system going forward. Transparency, we need to know what these algorithms are, regular publication to calculate um, allocated revenues, costs, spending. We need accountability of these central costs that, that are taken from the academic units um, and how well they support our mission. And we certainly need representation, which we do not have, over key budget decisions and key resource allocation decisions that absolutely impinge on our ability to deliver a quality education. All right, um, that's it for me. And I look forward to hearing from the others and having a, a conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Michelle. I think we're gonna have Andrew Goldstone next from the English department. He's gonna be talking about uh, tenure trends. Okay, I have slides as well. <clears throat> like any self-respecting English professor, I have some data visualizations. Um, <clears throat> let's see. How's this? Okay. So I'm gonna talk about the, the, mostly I'm gonna talk about the job of teaching and who is doing it at Rutgers and nationally. I'll say a little bit about research um, and I'll try to compare Rutgers to some of the broader field of higher education in the US. Um, why, is, why would the question of tenure be a budget question or finance question at all? Um, well, it goes like this. Uh, according to our president, Jonathan Holloway, the bulk of Rutgers expenses is found in people. You are an expense to Jonathan Holloway. And he said in his budget address, we can anticipate that 65% of the budget is gonna be dedicated to salaries and fringe benefits for our employees. So from the management perspective, the big issue with people is how much they cost. And nobody's more expensive than a tenure track or tenured faculty member, except possibly a TA given the way they reckon it. Those are the big line items. So they're always looking for ways to make people cost less. And I just wanna say by the by, you know, as an expressor, no, I've got to check his math here a little bit. That's 65%. Um, yeah, if you look at it a little closely, first of all, the state pays a good chunk of fringe benefits, pays two thirds of fringe benefits. So the, the real number of how much of compensation uh, with the proportion of the budget devoted to compensation is more like 55%. Uh, but the number that I think is in illuminating uh, for thinking about tenure and teaching uh, is the amount of money that, that Rutgers says it devotes to instruction. In the most recent financial report, that number was about $900 million. And tuition revenue is more than a billion dollars, just on its own, setting aside things like state funding. So there's really what the economist Stephen Shulman calls an instructional surplus at Rutgers. Instruction makes money for Rutgers. Uh, and in fact, one of the important ways that management can boost its revenues is to increase the instructional surplus. How does it do that? Um, it grows the surplus in general, uh, partly by conservative budgeting. Michelle already cited this really important document, the financial report on the allocation and transfer resources. One of the cool things about this document is that it shows the budget and then it shows the actual results. So what you can see here, if you can just not let your brain be jangled by the numbers, is that for example, for last year, Rutgers said it was going to make uh, about a billion two hundred and eighty-four million in tuition and fees, but it actually took in a billion three hundred million. It said it was going to pay out two billion eight hundred and eighty-six million in compensation. It paid out uh, eighty million less than that. And the end result of all this is that they wrote a budget where they said they were going to end up one hundred and thirty million dollars in deficit but they actually ended with $150 million in surplus. So, there, so the budget, which is what a department chair lives with, for example, constrains all the decisions, uh, is the document by which that surplus is, as Michelle showed us, Hoover way to somewhere else, that you never see the surplus that, has, that is actually happening. One of the key ways to generate that surplus is to keep increasing the instructional revenue and lower the instructional cost. Rutgers, uh, uh, charges a lot of tuition. And over the years, Rutgers keeps increasing the size of its student body. The left-hand chart here is all Rutgers students. Uh, the blue is undergrad, green grad, and, and red professional. Um, and you can see the steady increase in the size, the overall size of the student body. I'm just looking since the medical school merger. 
uh, steadily increasing over time. By contrast, the size of the instructional staff has, has actually shrunk. Um, not only has, has the proportion of tenure track faculty shrunk, but actually the overall size is smaller. If you count in TAs who are doing teaching, MTTs, part-time lecturers, and tenure and tenure track faculty, uh, you can just see in absolute numbers. Not only do they keep increasing uh, the size of the student body, they're actually shrinking this total instructional staff. That's how they're increasing that instructional surplus. Um, so here is a comparison of how Rutgers is doing in terms of turning all of its faculty into non-tenure track and, and part-time faculty in comparison with our Big Ten peers. I hope this graph isn't too overloaded. Uh, what you see in each panel is the proportion of all instructional staff, including TAs, in each of the particular categories, grads, full-time NTTs, part-time lecturers, and tenure, tenure track faculty over time, with the red line exemplifying Rutgers and the other white lines being the other Big Ten campuses. Uh, now, a lot of, I could talk forever about this particular chart, but I just call your attention to some basic facts on view here. Rutgers tops the league in PTLs. Rutgers loves its adjuncts. It has more adjuncts proportionally than any of its peer institutions. Rutgers is kind of in the lower two thirds on tenure and tenure track faculty. Um, don't be deceived by the apparent uptick in 2020. That's because of all of the PTLs who were terminated at the start of the pandemic by uh, initially by Barchi's administration and then uh, resoundingly reinforced by Holloway's administration. The one category that keeps on growing is full-time non-tenure track faculty. Um, what I'm showing here, by the way, uh, is non-medical. There are a lot of ways to slice this pie, but non-medical instructional faculty, the one category that Rutgers has consistently grown uh, is the full-time non-tenure track faculty. They are the ones who are shouldering the increased teaching burden of the ever-increasing student body, while the other categories are more or less flat or in the case of PTLs, shrinking. And you can see that by just changing the baseline here. These are per student, uh, per undergrad student, rather than uh, as a proportion of all staff. And you can see that we've had fewer and fewer tenured and tenure track faculty uh, for our undergrads and gradually increasing the number of NTTs we're covering our undergrads. Broadly speaking, the charts, the charts kind of match up for all the peer institutions. We're pretty aggressive, Rutgers compared to peers. You can see that NTTs at Rutgers are larger proportionally uh, than at the other Big Ten institutions. Um, and so this is really Rutgers is in trend, but kind of leading the trend on casualizing instruction, not purely by switching to PTLs, though we have more of those than anyone else, uh, but by, by replacing tenure track teaching by non-tenure track full-time teaching. Um, the national picture, just to give the context here, um, you know, Rutgers is not uh, radically out of line. Uh, here's some long-term data from the AAUP. Uh, the green line shows part-time faculty at all colleges and universities in the US, including even for-profits. The blue line shows tenured and tenure track and the red NTTs. And again, the trend that really deserves some thought here that's been under-publicized in discussions of tenure in higher education um, is the growth in the full-time non-tenure track faculty. That is the one category that is always increasing year on year, even though it's outstripped by PTLs. Um, if you're thinking about who's doing instructional work and what the trends are, the big trend here is shifting to the full-time non-tenure fac faculty. We're down at about 10% of, of all of the instructional faculty in 1976, now more like 30%. Um, all right, this is more of the national picture. The, the point is that it is possible to do this differently. There are liberal arts colleges where most of the faculty are tenured and tenure track. I'm not gonna dwell on this one. Um, I'm happy to come back to this, this kind of picture of the field later. And I'm also <laughs> not gonna drown in these charts. Um, I wanna just move to one point about research, which is that there is a relationship between casualizing instruction and who does the research, because the more casual, the, so whether tenure, tenure track, full-time non-tenure track, or part-time, the more casual the position, the less likely the position has a research responsibility. 
So as you increase casualization, you are decreasing the amount of the faculty who are also uh, have as their job description research. If you want a university system where teaching is done by researchers, uh, then you have to fight casualization uh, on, on all its fronts and preserve the tenure track. That's the, that's the way it's located. Um, all right, just want to show that. So um, this is the broad picture. Rutgers follows the leader, more or less, uh, follows the, the broad picture, though it's ahead on uh, casualized part-time lectures. It uses them more, but also it is increasing the share of full-time non-tenure track faculty. And it's easy to extrapolate two possible futures from this overall picture. Um, for Rutgers, as for its peers, uh, the, the kind of default is land at a rump of about 30% tenure to tenure track faculty. That's enough to pretend that you still have professors as people conceive them um, and leave room for a management led race to the bottom in the peer group over who can uh, maximize the instructional surplus fastest with eventually the whole system being subject to the kinds of shocks that are being administered in states like Georgia and Florida where tenure uh, is gonna be legislated away. Um, also important here is that this is not a story purely about adjunctification. The eventual trend is the replacement of part-timers who are easy to fire uh, by full-time NTT labor. Um, and the overall result here, I think, will be a continuing erosion of educational quality uh, a continuing erosion of research capacity and the undermining of academic freedom and shared governance as the body of the tenured and tenure track faculty, the only faculty whose jobs provide real academic freedom, uh, is, is relegated to a shrinking proportion of an ever-growing university with an ever-growing instructional surplus. I think it's worth imagining another future. Um, it, in fact, it's amazing. In, in a stroke of the pen, one contract could change that percentage of tenured and tenure track faculty from 30 to something like 55 or 60 by creating teacher, teacher tenure and research tenure and making all current non-tenure track faculty eligible. Do that and you have, uh, suddenly you could say TTT percent, 65 would be on track to compete with the elite small liberal arts colleges whose faculties are mostly tenured and tenure track. And in the ideal version of this future, a re-empowered faculty could restrain management's wasteful spending and initiate a virtuous cycle in which increased educational and research quality gives more legitimacy to the university as the provider of a public good uh, and give the public better reason to provide enhanced public support conditioned on good labor practices at the university. So these are the two medium to long-term futures that lie before us it will be easy to slide into the default future of serving management's accumulation of surpluses. But the alternative is completely feasible. It's completely feasible if we attend to the double compromise uh, of overuse of part-time lecturers and replacement of tenure and tenure track faculty by full-time non-tenure track faculty. That is underway and has been underway at Rutgers uh, for quite a long time. That's all. Thanks so much, Andrew. Before I introduce the next speaker, I noticed there's a few questions in the chat. I'm wondering if um, Michelle, Andrew, or the others might want to take them up. The first one is uh, what percentage of the surplus is from reserves that are committed for faculty research accounts, if that's known? I don't have an answer to that, but I can try to find out. Is that from Tara? If yes. Tara's here, could you just speak the question so we understand it and make sure that I understand the question? Okay, well, we'll... Um, Actually, I, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to understand, we are told that some of the money that the union says the university has is actually money that is supposed to that is already committed to faculty for research some faculty are given some funds to support their research i guess they're called faculty uh, research accounts or faculty unreserved accounts and i'd like to understand what percentage of the surplus the union finds is actually that money that really is committed to faculty for research 
I think it's a very specific that. question. Yeah, it's a great question. We Here, could... Let's see. This document was obtained in the course of the, the legal process around uh, the fiscal emergency. And uh, Tara, what it shows is a breakdown of the unrestricted net assets of the university that what we call the unrestricted reserve uh, and its designations by the, by the board of governors and the, the CFO. And what you can see here, uh, looking down the totals is that on management's reckoning, this, this, was, um, this was in 2019, uh, about 80 million uh, of the unrestricted reserve of at that time, 580 million was faculty funds. And by far the largest uh, component of the unrestricted reserve was uh, unrestricted endowment, uh, it, it, which isn't really an endowment, but which is, in other words, money that, that the Board of Governors intends to sit on. There's another question in the chat um, from Bob Boykus. What fraction of our budget, if this is known, goes for instruction now? And what was it 25 years ago, if, that, if that's known? To go back 25 years, Bob, I'd, I'd have to do a little more research there. Um, but it's a, it's a good one. I mean, the, the thing I'd highlight, what did I look at? Um, over, the, over 15 years, um, spending, how did it go? Spending on instruction tripled and spending on administration quintupled. Which sort of goes with the other question about what the fraction of the budget that goes to administrative salaries. Just, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to, to look this. We don't have this kind of detailed right. budget going back more than six or seven years. So it's it's sort of lost in the midst of time here. But in so far as the financial statements indicate, they indicate a significantly increased expenditure on administration, especially uh, created by the merger. And, and I just want to highlight that um, administrative salaries are a little different from the salaries for the rest of us because we all generate revenue. We, we generate um, tuition and so on. And central, of course, is important, um, we, but it's all coming out of the revenue that we generate, um, so. And finally, there is a question, I'm not sure if it's known, about the granting institutions giving researchers um, extra money to cover indirect costs at other institutions. Um, I don't know if your research discovered, um, came up with that. It's from Kathleen Shannon. It says granting institutions give researchers extra money on top of the grant to cover indirect costs, right? The maintenance, the use of buildings, et cetera. Um, is it standard practice to include those extra funds in a department budget, though in reality, the department never actually has access to those funds? That's a good one for us to look into, yes? I, I don't have the There answer. might be a department chair in the audience who knows the answer. Okay. But we are aware, I'll just say this, we are aware from management's report on responsibility center management that there is a lot of um, discontent um, among even deans, uh, as well as chairs of departments about the, al the allocation of those indirect cost recovery funds. Right. And one thing just to be clear about Gary's question, when people here are referring to administration, they mean the top administration, not the administrators who are part of the staff and who are unionized employees and are not making anything like those money. So they're talking about management um, in, that, in that point. Um, there's one other question before we move on to Juan. And I believe that's, um, does the state partially fund administrative benefits? And if so, um, is it at the same proportion as it underwrites faculty benefits? Good question. Good question. These are excellent questions, by the way, for us to collect. So uh, bear with us because I don't think any of us have these answers at our fingertips, but we'd love to, these are excellent. So keep them coming and stuff for us to look into. Thank you. I'm going to move on um, in the program and let uh, Juan Gonzalez come in. Juan, of course, is from the School of Communication Information, um, Democracy Now!, and is going to be speaking here about um, the, the spending of the HER funds, of the, the CARES Act funds, the federal monies for COVID. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I... Oops. Juan, sorry, you were just muted accidentally. 
Hi, folks. I'm, uh, I'm not going to try to uh, share a big uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to have one page that I'm going to uh, uh, put up in a minute. But uh, first, I think the, th the key to understand uh, in terms of the COVID monies uh, that have come into the university is that this was an unprecedented amount of uh, unspoken for money, basically, uh, except that there was a big portion for the students direct that were supposed to go in direct aid to the students. But for the most part, the university was free to decide where it wanted to use this money to make up for losses uh, that, that resulted from the shutdown, the campus shutdowns and the pandemic. Uh, and so it was uh, basically new money. And I think, uh, you know, some of you know, I, I was a longtime journalist and we always used to have a joke uh, in the in the journalism profession. My colleagues would always say that the greatest part of their creative writing came when they were filling out expense reports. Uh, because financial reports are creative writing, uh, and uh, and you can you can get them to sing or 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 not sing or or, or cry for problems uh, anytime you want if you're a good financial uh, uh, director. Uh, and I think that the there was enormous amounts of money that came in, uh, and that um, so much money that not only Rutgers, but every local agency and university, public university in the country knows that the federal government will never be able to track all this money. There's just too much of it that came at one time uh, and that the ability to audit how this money was spent is almost non-existent. There are enough people in the federal government to be able to track all this money in a way so that it provides leeway for hiding or diverting funds in ways uh, that uh, uh, we, we are not, we can't even imagine. For instance, I asked Bunces during his presentation uh, that Rutgers received about $128 million uh, from COVID monies from the federal government that was supposed to go directly to student grants. Uh, would it, was it possible, or did he see in the analysis whether the university reduced its scholarship numbers for th that year and in essence, replaced its former scholarship monies with, uh, with COVID monies. Uh, it's a way of keeping money uh, and, uh, and having the government replace what you would normally would have spent. And Bunces did say that from his preliminary look, it did seem that there was a reduced amount of scholarship money that was given out during the COVID years, uh, as opposed to just the regular COVID uh, uh, emergency grants. Uh, so. Um, so I think that now uh, I had a group of my students in my investigative reporting class do a, a deep dive into this for about a year and a half ago. I'm proud to say that they won the top prize nationwide for investigative reporting by college newspapers for the series of articles that they did from the uh, from the investigative reporters and editors. Uh, and I, Rutgers had a big uh, problem trying to be able to tout that achievement for their students since they were revealing how Rutgers was not appropriately reporting uh, the money that it was spending. But anyway, I think the main page that I want to share, let's see if I can get it up here. Uh, do I have share capacity here? Uh, uh, that is uh, share. I oh, know, that's just the Bunches report. Hold on one second. Okay, I can't find it right now. All right, here's what I'll tell you. I'll, I'll give it to you in, in brief on my in my in my own number since I've got it here. Is um, the university received altogether three hundred and sixty-five million dollars, one of the biggest grants of any public university in the country, uh, from uh, both the feds and the state. Uh, you know, of that, approximately eighty million came from the state, uh, and the rest came from the federal government. Uh, it. It received in student money from the federal government $128 million. Uh, it received uh, in institutional money from the, from the federal government and the state $236 million. So roughly $350 with about one-third supposedly going directly to students and two-thirds going to the university. Uh, ho however, the university has not accounted you could go, if you do a search and you just go to um, uh, COVID-19 disclosures Rutgers, and you'll see their reports on the three tranches of money that came in. There was the CARES Act, uh, the first CARES Act, which came in, uh, in March of 2020, the second CARES Act at the tail end of the Trump administration, 
uh, in uh, it was approved in December of of uh, of uh, uh, 2020, and then the HERF, uh, the American Re Rescue Act, which was Joe Biden's uh, big that was the big one, uh, which came in March of 21. So there were three tranches of federal money. There were three tranches of state money uh, that came in. Uh, and the university, when it comes to reporting its institutional expenditures, is very lax. It still hasn't filled, filed most of its, uh, uh, of its uh, American Rescue Plan money, which was the biggest tranche, uh, uh, on, its, on the forms that it's supposed to file for the federal government. The state government, you've got to actually uh, make a public records request. Uh, to be able to get how it's spent uh, to the state to get how it's spent its state money. And, um, uh, but in the federal money, it's supposed to report it on its website and it's not fully doing it. Uh, I, I looked as of December 31st, 2021, which was their last report, most of the federal money, institutional money, they have not accounted for. Uh, and, uh, but there's other uh, aspects of the COVID money that the university doesn't give much play to, but which can be seen in their financial report. For instance, the, the, the latest audit shows that Rutgers made uh, $53.6 million in additional health revenues, 8% uh, increase in health revenues, which the main driver of which was revenues from COVID testing in the New Jersey correctional system. Now understand that uh, Rutgers it, uh, runs the health system for the corrections uh, department of New Jersey, was testing all employees and uh, all inmates on a weekly basis and was re receiving enormous revenues as a result from, uh, from that activity. It also had an increase of $43 million in contract revenues this year, 6.9% increase. Uh, that was mainly, according to the audit, uh, attributed to COVID-19 research at Robert Wood Johnson and, uh, uh, and the medical school. Uh, so um, that's $100 million in new revenues that the university got as a result of COVID. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, there, in addition to that, the university sold off the uh, uh, RUCDR, the DNA registry, uh, an entire institution that it privatized at the beginning of the pandemic. It sold it for $44 million uh, to a privatized concern called Infinity Biologics. I don't see anywhere in the financial report an accounting of where that money went. Uh, and, uh, and I think that Bunce should take a look at that because it doesn't, uh, there doesn't appear to be in the last financial report any, any tracking of that money coming in or how it was spent. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, the privatization of RUCDR as part of the agreement, as my students discovered, Rutgers was supposed to receive a royalty of two dollars per COVID uh, per COVID uh, saliva test that Infinity Biologics did, and it did hundreds of millions of these tests all around the United States after it was privatized. So there is potentially a huge amount of money that Rutgers is receiving in royalties on the saliva test uh, that doesn't seem to be accounted for anywhere uh, in the report, or at least singled out uh, uh, by the uh, by the financial report. Uh, so I think that there are, there are major questions that still need to be resolved on how the institutional money is being spent or will be spent. Uh, what happened to the privatization of an entire division of Rutgers? Uh, Jay Tishman himself in an interview with my students said that this type of privatization of an entire portion of a university had never been tried before. Uh, and so it was really a, a whole experimental project. Uh, and that, uh, and there's still the student money. Uh, how, what portion of the students' money was actually replacement money for scholarship money that Rutgers would otherwise have spent? So I think those are the, the, the key questions and issues that still revolve around the biggest single uh, federal grant uh, that Rutgers had ever, has ever received in, uh, which in terms of all this COVID money. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Juan. Um, the final speaker and people can uh, pose questions in the chat and, um, and, and, and come on screen and, and ask the speakers after this. Sorry, I'm sorry, before we just go to Mark, does, I just wanted to ask if anyone did have a question for Juan. No problem. Because we're moving on to a different topic. If anyone, that's pretty remarkable facts there. Yeah, 
We'll let that marinate for a bit. Okay. Your questions. Um, Mark Killingsworth is going to be speaking about uh, athletics. He's got a tall order to fall. Go ahead. Oh, can you see this? Yes. Okay. With a, which starts out with a quote from President Barchi. Correct. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So uh, just after he arrived, um, Dr. Barchi uh, was interviewed by the Star Ledger editorial board, and he commented that athletics is, quote, siphoning dollars away from the academic mission. Outsiders seem to see this very, very clearly. Um, and uh, I think it's also instructive at virtually the same time, Purdue's president, Mitch An Daniels, uh, commented that if you're uh, taking tuition money away from families who are trying to pay tuition to pay for themselves, then they ought to look in the mirror. Uh, uh, and he, he put it, my view is the athletic department's minimum aim ought to be to break even and not become a drain on the rest of the university. Well, uh, interesting, sort of the alpha and omega of um, commentary on uh, university and college athletics. Uh, so what is the situation? Well, the siphoned dollars are going into funny places. Uh, 2,500 bucks for a sound system to generate fake crowd noise for football practice. 12,400 for a power nap machine, a pod that you can climb into and have a power nap. Um, uh, and it just goes on and on. Uh, over $300,000 for new multicolored lighting for the football stadium tunnel so that the uh, players, when they exit the locker room and go onto the field, will have a particularly dramatic entrance, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, Abbott Koloff and Gene Rimbach of the uh, North Jersey paper uh, have done an, an incredible job tracking down all this stuff. Uh, and the, even the Targum got into the act. <clears throat> Um, uh, another one is $450,000 in DoorDash orders from football players. And apparently that was because there were, where there were difficulties in getting the regularly catered meals for them. So they had to, they were allowed to order from uh, DoorDash. So that's where some of the siphon dollars are going. Um, the result of that, and a whole lot else besides, is that <clears throat> our revenues are, go are lag way, way behind expenses. Um, the data that I'm providing, by the way, does not include the COVID era, um, because uh, COVID did a uh, huge harm to all sorts of university budgets, uh, particularly athletics budgets, because uh, seasons were canceled, seasons were truncated, um, and so the result was that um, an awful lot of uh, schools uh, had a lot of expenses and because they weren't playing, uh, generated a, a lot less in games, were getting a lot less in media revenue. But uh, historically, Rutgers Athletics uh, have gone, uh, expenses have outstripped um, uh, uh, expense <laughs> income several fold. So here's the trend line nice and crude for <clears throat> um, uh, expenses and revenue, I think you'll agree, is growing at a slower rate. So naturally enough, you've got a widening deficit. <clears throat> uh, and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Um, so the next <laughs> problem is, how do you pay for all that? Well, the deficit in current operations we have paid for um, in several different ways. We've gotten loans from the Big Ten. Of course, they have to be repaid. And they are being repaid in part by uh, some uh, media money that we would otherwise have been able to spend, but which we spent before we received it. It's sort of like if I'm expecting a raise for next year, if I rush out and spend the money on a fancy new car now, I'm gonna be in trouble because I've got to pay, the, pay off the debt later on. Well, that's exactly the position that we find ourselves in. Uh, the athletics department has also gotten lots of loans from the university, a little more about that later. And there are direct and indirect subsidies from the university. And last but certainly not least, student fees. Uh, because as we will see, the uh, uh, athletic department takes some of the so-called campus activity fee. 
for its operations. Now, um, we are in, we are definitely, just as Turkey used to be called the sick man of Europe, um, uh, uh, Rutgers is the sick man of uh, athletics in the Big Ten. Uh, but it ain't necessarily so, or at least it doesn't have to be necessarily so. Um, I've tabulated here again for the pre-pandemic era. So this is not contaminated by all the crazy stuff that was going on with the pandemic. Revenues, expenses, and deficit, at least some of the highlighted highlights. Um, we have, and, and I, I think the comparison between Rutgers and Indiana and Purdue is particularly instructive because our athletic programs are about the same size. Um, and uh, the student bodies, while there actually are two schools, both of these are in Indiana, only one in Rutgers. But despite the fact that these two schools are duking it out against each other for contributions, Rutgers gets only roughly half their, their contributions, uh, their ticket sales, pardon me. Uh, we sold 8.4 million in 2019 to 20. Um, Indiana uh, sold about twice that much. Purdue sold about 50% more than we did. Contributions at Rutgers are in woefully anemic, um, 10 times the size for Indiana and about uh, six times the size in Purdue. We don't, in other words, collect nearly the same amount of contributions that either of these schools gets. We don't sell uh, quite as much for game day things, rev royalties, things like uh, sweatshirts and t-shirts and things like that. And here's part of the problem with our TV and media and conference revenues, which are a good deal lower than they were for Indiana and Purdue, we've been spending those in advance. So recently, at least, they've knocked off some of the revenue that we get because the Big Ten needs to be repaid. And so that slices 10 to $20 million off of what would otherwise have gone to us. Uh, this is very important. We take 12.7 million in student fees. Neither Indiana nor Purdue takes a dime. And virtually all the other Big Ten schools, except I think Iowa and Maryland, don't take any student fees at all. Um, we get 11.9 in, in institutional support, and we also got loans from both from the Big Ten and from Rutgers itself. So when all is said and done, there are obviously other categories. These are just the highlights. But when all is said and done, our total revenue for athletics was 55 million. Our total expenses were 114 million. So we had a deficit of about 60 million and it's greater in the current, in the, in the fiscal year uh, 21 to 20, no, sorry, 20 to 21. We're not going to know the situation from 21 to 22 until next January because there's about an eight month lag before they have to release their report. Um, so, we noticed that we spent not terribly different, our total expenses were not terribly different for Indiana and Purdue, but our revenues, of course, were way, way, way different. We cover less than 50% of our costs out of our own revenue. The rest of it, we have to fund by getting loans and taking student fees and getting money from the uh, university, borrowing, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, Purdue, good old Mitch Daniels <laughs> in charge there, actually ran a surplus. Indiana run, uh, ran a tiny little deficit, but both of those schools managed to function. Now, I could have also shown you Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. They are mega million earners. Uh, they're not in financial trouble. They never were, and they probably never will be. So the little schools, I think, are a better a basis for comparison. And I think the experience of Indiana and Purdue show that it's possible to uh, operate a program that more or less breaks even, uh, but not if we don't, if we squander TV revenues and not if we're unable to get contributions. Um, and so that raises the question, is the development uh, operation uh, failing? Maybe they should be fired and somebody else should be put in their place. Or maybe, God forbid, we're trying to market something that not enough people want to buy, which is why we don't get much of the way of contribution. Well, okay, so we, our deficit, uh, uh, or rather our revenue is uh, well under half of our operating costs, but there's also the matter of debt. 
because we owe an estimated total of more than a quarter of a billion dollars for loans that the university made to athletics to help fund these deficits. And recently there have been reports that the university is considering forgiving over $84 million uh, in, in, for some of these loans and just canceling the loans, uh, swallowing the loss and uh, not charging any further interest. There may be more debt on the way because uh, Coach Fiano asked for and got a promise to build for him a new $150 million practice facility for football. Uh, not a whole lot of specifics yet about how that's going to be paid for or whether the co contributions are merely pledges or actually money in the bank. Um, and I have to say that um, in order to find out this stuff, um, it has proven to be an endless cycle of um, uh, Open Public Record Act requests and other investigative journalism uh, that would do credit for the uh, January 6th investigation committee uh, because it is very difficult indeed. The athletics program is not transparent. They don't like to produce information. They stonewall. Um, and so it took, for example, the North Jersey paper something like eight months to, uh, uh, to, to pry some of this information out. Um, uh, but I think what started the ball rolling was the AAUP, which sued the university, alleging that they were incorrectly hiding behind what they regard as, regarded as false claims about being exempt from having to disclose the stuff. They lost in court. So, uh, th and that's, I think, what set the North Jersey paper uh, in motion, collecting far more of this information. But as I say, it was a massive job of um, uh, uh, getting um, a, a lot of uh, information previously Oprah or previously denied Oprah. So what's the bottom line here? Well, Governor Murphy says, after he saw some of these uh, accounts in the press, that the, the financial state of Rutgers Athletics, uh, that's quite, quite concerning. And he added, having, just having read what I read, it takes your breath away. And President Holloway said, Rutgers Athletics debt and deficits are unsustainable. But I think that's not true. Uh, the Rutgers athletics situation is entirely sustainable because ticket sales may go down, donors may be hard to come by, but athletics you can fund exactly the same way you always have by, as President Barchi recognized, by siphoning dollars from academics. Not a problem. And you may wonder, you know, wh where are the Board of Governors and the Board of Trustees in all of this? They're silent. And I think that means that they're perfectly happy with what's going on. So you can talk about the athletics debt, you can talk about the deficits, you can talk about the financial follies, but the Board of Governors and the Board of Trustees haven't, haven't admitted a peep. And I think that's a very, very clear indication that uh, uh, they support this business model. So I'd say, <laughs> to coin a phrase, that academics, from the point of view of the um, uh, athletics department is a beloved cash cow because that's where the money comes from ultimately in order to fund these things. Uh, so um, in conclusion, you may remember that the Marx Brothers film uh, Horse Feathers features Groucho as Professor Wagstaff. He's the new president of Huxley College and the Huxley football team is about to play their bitter rival Darwin College. So Groucho is meeting with faculty members. And if you'll give me a moment, I will remind you of what happened. So let's stop that share. And I'm gonna go on to something else in just one tick. Uh, and where is that? Oh dear, well, okay. <laughs> Not ready to share that yet. Um, so give me one more second. Oh, how embarrassing. Um, don't worry, we'll wait. Okay, well, have a sec. <laughs> You're going to have to wait, I'm afraid. Um, so. It's always worth waiting for the Marx Brothers. Well, is... yes, I would agree. So actually. it's really um, fine. Just... So, oh, what? Ha oh, here we go. All right, I think we're ready. Yeah. Okay, so now let's go back and by with the wonders of Zoom, 
I'm going to share, at least I hope I am. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, let's see. So, uh, one moment. Share the screen. Good. Okay. And you should now be able to see the little clip from, can you see this? This is with Groucho? Yes. Got it? Okay. I can. Okay, so here we go. It's not long, don't worry. Oh. There's always an ad. It's the price of doing business. There we go. No, I don't want that either. What is this? Sorry, no thanks. Mark, I, think I think you, you click the next Twitter. button and not play. Yeah, you hit fast forward through that video. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I think you may also have to be sure that you click the share audio. Um, I think, well, I thought I did. But, okay. Um, right. Perhaps we should move on and Mark can give this to us. As we don't see it right now. Yeah, well, why, don't, why, don't we, uh, why don't we take some questions? Okay, um, sure. And get and the I'll questions get out you, for you. I'll get you the video in just a second. Okay. I know there were some questions in the chat. Yeah, I noticed Bob and Maria had questions in the chat. Did you guys want to raise those? Yeah, I, there, there's no question about the size of uh, athletic deficit. And that naturally, it comes because the revenue is low and expenses are high. But uh, what I want to know is who is responsible for this and why are we among the national leaders in athletic deficits? Okay, the well, problem is that we're, running deficit. we're running a deficit that's more than everybody else's deficit. Okay, can can you uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, ultimately, that's an administrative decision, um, and I think that it's the case that um, when he was when he first became president, and uh, Dr. Barty made those remarks, um, somebody took him to the woodshed, and said, "We don't want to hear about how." Um, athletics is siphoning dollars from the academic mission. That's out of bounds. You're hired, I think they said, to promote object objectives of the board. And this is what the board wants. Now, not all boards want that. Clearly, Mitch Daniels does just fine with his board at Purdue, which is not insisting that Purdue be number one in everything. So I think that's up to the, not just the president, uh, he's basically the servant of the board. And it's certainly not Pat Hobbs's job. He's the servant of the president and the board. He's doing what they want. And if it were really so concerning, and if it were really so unsustainable, the Board of Governors would have called in <laughs> Hobbs and, and uh, Holloway and said, enough is enough. No more outrageous spending. But uh, they go on spending. And the only way I can understand that is that that is, not an, that is not a problem for the board. They want Rutgers to be number one. And, and you heard it from Debashish Dutta. You heard it from all sorts of other people who've come in and out of administrative roles. You got to spend money in order to make money. I've, I've heard that. I've been at this place for almost 45 years. And every so often, that's exactly what you hear. And the administration and the boards in particular believe that as if it were the gospel. So you think it's all the responsibility of the Board of Governors? Absolutely. And I think they want Rutgers to be tops in number one. Now, the other thing I think is that over the last couple of years, funding for SAS, my home base, went up by 10%. This is the vote of the board. And funding for athletics went up 13%. Do you really think that all of the financial follies of athletics uh, are something that the board is concerned about? No, they want it. They want to promote more of it. They want locker rooms with uh, flat panel TVs over every kid's locker. They want people getting things from DoorDash because it's good for recruiting and so forth and so on. Uh, that's the only way I can understand this. I certainly think that if the boards were upset by this, they'd come crashing down on President Holloway and on Hobbs. That has not happened. 
Thanks. We've had a couple of other questions um, that people are posing. One is from Michelle asking if- Robert oh, No, no, go on to others. That's okay. I'm just- And Leticia um, has a question here about, do we have on record the growth or plan when Rutgers went into contract with Big Ten um, that of course was anticipated, but how far off the mark is Rutgers? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, we joined the Big Ten in 2014, but we joined as junior members, which meant that we didn't get the full payout that every other school did. Now, there, are, there have been some moves afoot because of various uh, complexities that we might get some of that back, we might get a full share, et cetera. But the point was that entering the Big Ten turned out to be, <laughs> in a perverse sort of way, a godsend for, for our athletic program because the Big Ten was willing to loan us money. And we took it. We got huge amounts of money. We got 15 or $16 million worth of loans in a single academic year. And talk about not being transparent. The athletics program put that in their financial statement and called it, guess what? Revenue. And they called it revenue because they got the loan in anticipation of getting revenue in future years. So I guess that made it revenue today, you know, which is really quite something. So, uh, but the, the bottom line is that we have basically squandered the opportunity to get um, uh, 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 media payouts and other things from the Big Ten because we've used it uh, to in, in an attempt to spend money on other things. So um, Mark, charged. just a quick question on that note. Does the Big Ten charge interest? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, the, and uh, the, the Big Ten doesn't even have available, and neither does our uh, athletics program, have any records of the, of the financial records of the loans that they made to us. So talk about lack of transparency. Uh, the, the dialogue is, um, do we have a stadium? Yes. Do we have a university? Yes. But we can't afford both. So let's start tearing down the university now. Um, and uh, basically, there are people who put far greater priority over university athletics than they do on education. And I think we've seen that. That's a crystal clear uh, message in President Holloway's two presidential addresses. Uh, this is our university front yard and you know, so forth and so on. Well, I agree. And I think the important point that gets lost in the shuffle here is, is it really necessary to have deficits of $55 million in order to achieve that? Mitch Daniels is able to do it and he can break even. Indiana University is able to do it and they can break even. Lots of schools are able to do it and break even. Uh, and the biggies don't need to break even, they more than break even. Ohio State and Penn State actually contributed money, and so did the Purdue uh, athletics program, to build academic buildings. So the balance of trade went in the other direction. But um, the idea here is we're going to spend the last academic dollar we can find in order to get into the athletic big time. Thank you. On that note, Alan, I know you're hosting, but I'd like to make a comment. So when appropriate. Sure, we were gonna open up for general Q&A. So why don't I bring on the other speakers as well? And, um, and uh, but you go ahead first. Yeah, I just reacting to what Mark just said and thinking about Holloway's speech last spring in which he said that athletics was not going to be profitable, but we shouldn't expect it to be because its value is impossible to measure. Whereas things like libraries and so on is a transactional problem and we're facing austerity. And I, I just want to stress the reversal of those concepts that in fact, athletics is something that can make money transactionally and we can measure the value in dollars and cents, but just we all know this, education is something we cannot measure the value of because the value of what we do gets sent out into the world and expresses itself decades and decades later. We can't monetize that value and yet it's enormous. And so by reversing it, it puts us in the position of having to fight to, to show that we're making money on something that we can't make money from 
and never to show money on something that we can make money from. So it's just striking me um, as, as a real problem of, of rhetoric and more. If there are any final questions that people have, please take advantage of our brain trust here while we have them. I'd also like to just, I'm sorry, I'm just, um, to ask people to please give us suggestions for things we can be looking at as a committee going forward and help hear from your vision and your lived experiences on the issues of the budget. I have something to say about that too. You know, um, it feels the thing about the budget is that we experience it as a constraint and our, you know, our main point here is, has been to try to encourage everybody to see it as actually the place where management is doing a lot of, a lot of things, even though they act like it's a constraint on them, they produce the constraints for us and then move the money around. And so the question is, where do you reverse, where are the places in the life of the university where you could reverse this false constraint? Um, how could we begin to do that? One thing I want to say, since I know there actually are department chairs here is, gosh, uh, one of the places that the constraint gets acted out is at the level of department budgeting. There's, those aren't public. Uh, but if ever a department chair were willing to share a certain amount of information with their union colleagues about how money is, is or is not coming in and out of their department, it would help our investigations a lot and help might raise a wiser consciousness of how this process is putting so much pressure uh, on every level of the actual academic work of the university, from the classroom to the lab to the library, up to the people who are shouldering the burden of trying to keep departments and programs running. Can I jump in a little? Hi, hi everyone. Um, Becky Given, nice to see you all. I want to say a couple of things. One is um, I want to thank the members of this committee for their absolutely extraordinary work. This is um, work that has been going on for some time and it's really remarkable. And I can tell you that to have this information available, we are the envy of people working in other universities that we've done this much digging and that we have these committed folks who have become truly expert in something that is kept from us and is kept intentionally opaque. And I wanna thank them and I hope you will um, share this with your colleagues when we share the video and some of the materials and, and help people to sort of what I see is demystify uh, what's going on with the budget. And the other, the other thing I'll just say is let's keep talking about all this as Andrew just alluded to, there's a lot more we can do to dig and understand and be able to respond in a well-informed way when we're told that there's not money for this or the libraries need to make big cuts or, or any of those other pieces. Um, and I hope we can connect um, the ways that uh, Rutgers budget reflects its values and the, and the distance from the stated values with the values that we see in action in the budget. I think that um, our contract campaign uh, reflects many of the stated values that uh, that have been that are only uh, on the surface and are sort of rhetorical gestures without any substance behind them. So, I think by getting better informed and by understanding that it's not your fault if you're you know a program director and you're trying to uh, save administrative jobs and get a decent level of administrative support or trying to make. Uh, your grant stretch further, even though the fringe rate is making making your work impossible. You know, all of these things are connected. And so I think talking to each other, getting involved, if you have a department rep, checking in with your department rep, there are many, many different ways to engage as we uh, try to get a strong contract in place. And I, and I hope you all do so. And um, I'm really thankful to you for taking the time. Well, thanks everyone for coming out today. We'll be making this available to everyone. Thanks, folks. We look forward to engaging uh, again. <laughs>